Arrakis, Dune, Desert Planet, sole source of the spice drug Melange, basis of the Imperial Economy and the Emperor's Chome Corporation, center of the universe. If the spice flow stops, all eyes will turn to Arrakis. The Dune collectible card game is a game of political and economic rivalry, in which players each represent an imperial house vying for admission to the Landsraad High Council. One of the great houses has offered to support your admission, if you will first help them seize control of Arrakis. During the game you will gain the assistance of personalities both noble and infamous, obtain control of tangible resources and economic arrangements, and execute daring plots. Your opponents will try to thwart you through warfare, duels, leverage negotiations, and other strategies even more nefarious. The objective of the Dune CCG is to be accepted as a great house, and to do so you must fulfill the twin objectives of the Landsraad provisions, wealth and favor. To fulfill the provision of wealth, your house must have a hoard of at least 10 spice, and to fulfill the provision of favor, a house must possess at least 10 favor. Once the required spice and favor are earned, a house may request admission to the Landsraad High Council, winning the game. The Dune CCG has many different turns that cards use to refer to basic game actions. So before we explain the turn sequence, let's go over the parts of a card and some basic terms. While there are many different types of cards, they all share the same general structure. The deployment cost is found in the top left corner of cards. This cost indicates the number of Solaris that must be paid to bring the card into play. An X value means that the effect of the card will vary based on how much you choose to pay for the card. The action of putting a card into play is called deployment, which is why this value is called the deployment cost. The card name identifies the character, place, ability, or action that is represented by the card. All cards belong to one of five main types, and while types are represented by the general card design, most notably colors, most cards are further classified by subtypes, which are found underneath the art. Talents represent the basic abilities available in the Dune CCG. If a card possesses one or more talents, it will contain the corresponding talent icons found in the bottom left part of the card. The accompanying numbers are called talent ranks, indicating increasing degrees of expertise in the designated talent. In addition to a deployment cost, some cards may have a deployment restriction. There are two types of deployment restriction. A card's allegiance, which is indicated by the symbol of one of the Imperial powers, and a talent requirement, which is indicated by a talent icon and a number. These will be explained in detail later. A card's operation is found underneath its subtype, and explains the effects the card has during play. In the Dune CCG, if an operation contradicts a game rule, follow the operation on the card. Some cards may have a command value. This is the leadership and authority of holdings and personas, indicating the total number of deployed personnel cards that may be assigned to them. Cards may also have a resistance value, representing the inherent toughness, durability, or health of a card. Cards with no printed resistance value are still considered to have a resistance of 1. Here are some common terms that cards and rules will reference. Engagement or disengagement. The engagement of cards initiates most actions and effects in the game. To engage a card, rotate it 90 degrees. The card is now engaged and generates its desired action or effect. If something instructs to disengage a card, simply return it to its upright position. Governance. Governance is the control a house has over its forces. A house governs all deployed cards and tokens in its territory, no matter who owns them. The word governor, govern, or governing are used to refer not only to specific cards or tokens, but also to the player who controls the territory in which they are located. Owner. Owner refers to a player's physical property. When a card or rule refers to a card's owner, it always means the physical property of the player, regardless of where in the game the card has been deployed. Subduel or Subdued Subduel is the act of turning a card face down on the table. A subdued card is a face down card that has been depleted, hidden, injured, or otherwise removed from action for a while. 
Subdued cards accure one deferment token each opening interval, which will eventually help bring the card back. Any cards that are assigned or attached to a card that have been subdued remains assigned to them. Subdued cards may not normally be the target of game effects unless the card specifically says so. Subdued cards can neither be engaged nor assigned additional cards until they have been deployed, and are not considered to be governed by anyone. A house may, at any time, examine any subdued cards in their domain. Unique Some cards may have the unique trait in their subtype. Additionally, all Imperial cards, or cards with blue backs, are unique inherently. A card with the unique trait may not be deployed while any house has the same card currently deployed. Cards in the Dune CCG are sorted into one of two main groups. Cards with orange backs are known as house cards, while cards with blue backs are imperial cards. Both house and imperial cards are further sorted by five different card types as identified by their colors. Holdings, Personas, Resources, Plans, and Events. These are further separated into subtypes that are written underneath the card's art. House cards are typically played from hand during the Deploy a House Card operation, and Imperial cards are generally played from the Imperial Assembly during the Petition operation. Holdings have orange-red faces and are found in the Imperial deck. They are properties delegated to qualified houses of the Lancerad. All holdings except homeworlds are unique, meaning if one is governed, another one with the same name cannot be deployed, meaning played. There are four subtypes of holdings, homeworlds, fiefs, charters, and Siridar fiefs. Fiefs are regional planetary jurisdictions granted by the Landsrad to its member houses. They generally provide a steady source of Solaris for their governors. Homeworlds are fiefs shared by lesser houses. They are not considered unique, so multiple players may have the same homeworld. Homeworlds will usually provide a steady source of Solaris for their governor. Charters represent economic assets, including such diverse arrangements as partnerships, directorships, contracts, and investments. Because charters pertain to the industries and organizations of the Imperium, they are often aligned with an Imperial power. These, like other holding cards, provide resources for their governors. A Cyridar fief includes both territorial and economic rights. Thus, a Cyridar fief is both a fief and a charter. Dune is the only Cyridar fief in the game. Personas are yellow-faced cards. They are the central characters in the game, and are divided into two subtypes. Allies, which are Imperial cards, and Aids, which are House cards. All Personas are either Allies or Aids. If a Persona gains one of these subtypes by virtue of another game card, they lose their previous subtype. In other words, a Persona cannot be both an Ally and an Aid. Allies are prominent individuals who serve an Imperial power. All allies are subtyped as nobles or vassals. Nobles are hereditary members of the imperial aristocracy, and vassals are commoners who have distinguished themselves by their service. If an ally gains one of these subtypes, they lose their previous subtype. In other words, an ally cannot be both a noble and a vassal. Aids represent house retainers who strive to distinguish themselves through excellent service. Unlike allies, aids are not considered unique. Aids may become nobles or vassals as a result of a card or game effect, but they remain aids unless the effect also specifically grants them the ally subtype. If an aid gains the ally subtype, it ceases to be an aid, but it does not become unique. Resources are green-faced cards. They are the tools a house has available. Resources must be assigned to personas or holdings when deployed, and come in four subtypes. Personnel, Equipment, Enhancements, which are house cards, and decrees, which are imperial cards. Personnel represent groups who perform specific functions. Troops, corps, and unions are a few of the personnel subtypes available. Equipment represents the machinery and hardware used in the Imperium. Equipment subtypes include weapons, devices, and transports. Enhancements represent improvements or augmentations. Enhancements include skills and titles for personas, bastions for cities, and so forth. Decrees are enhancements granted by a great house. Because they are granted by great houses, they are imperial cards and often bear an allegiance. Plans are grey-faced cards. 
Like other card types, they are deployed to generate effects during the game. However, they usually only grant a one-time effect. Plans come in three types. Programs, which are Imperial cards, and Ventures and Tactics, which are both house cards. Programs are Imperial plans that give rewards for meeting certain goals. They are kept separate from the decks, and each are purchased at the start of the game and kept concealed face down under the homeworld until deployed. Like all Imperial cards, programs are unique. Ventures are special missions assigned to Personas. They typically have talent requirements since they represent task-specific operations. Ventures are discarded once their effects have been resolved. Tactics alter or modify the initiation, procedure, or outcome of operations. Unlike most other cards, tactics may also be deployed during a rival's house interval. All tactics belong to one of two subtypes, declaration and engagement, indicating when they are to be deployed. Most are further classified by the type of operation that they affect, such as initiative, petition, right, and so on. All tactics are discarded once their effects have been resolved. Events are blue-faced house cards. They depict sweeping changes within the Imperium or on the planet Dune. Though temporary in duration, events generate powerful effects that can significantly alter the game. Events have two subtypes, Imperium and Dune. During a house interval, several events may be placed face down, but only one Imperium event and one Dune event may be deployed. In addition, some events have the Nexus subtype. Nexus events have effects that last more than one turn. In short, there are many card types and subtypes, but they each perform a general, however distinct, function. Holdings generate revenue and assets. Personas are versatile and are mostly used to conduct rights. Resources are assigned to holdings and personas and will usually help those cards perform their tasks better. Plans are usually a one-time effect and can surprise your opponent. And finally, events are a powerful, more impactful version of plans. Talents are expert abilities used to initiate rights or use special cards. There are six talents. Dueling, Battle, Arbitration, Intrigue, Weirding, and Prescience. If a card has a talent, its talent icon will be on the lower left side of the card. The number next to the icon is the talent rank, and shows how skilled the card is in the talent. A talent rank of zero indicates a basic familiarity with the skill. It is important to note that cards without a talent icon do not have a rank of zero in that talent. Cards that give a bonus to a talent also bestow talent rank zero if the associated card lacks that skill. For instance, the card Arms Training gives a persona plus one dueling rank. If it is assigned to a persona without the dueling talent, the card first bestows rank zero, and then a plus one bonus, for a total of dueling one. In the same manner, a card that states Target Gains Dueling Talent bestows Dueling Zero on that persona. During the game, talents will serve two main purposes. The first is fulfilling deployment restrictions on cards, and the second is determining how powerful the card is during a right, or more colloquially, combat. The Dune CCG can be played with more than two players, but for this rules video we will be explaining examples from a one-on-one -on -one game. To begin, both players shuffle their house deck, meaning cards with orange backs, and place them face down. Then, both players place 20 of a token that represents their starting Solaris close to their house deck, and any starting spice tokens. Also, both players indicate an imperial favor of 10, via a dice or pen and paper. This area represents the house reserves, over the course of the game, players will draw cards from their house decks, and discard cards to their house discard. The house treasury contains a player's Solaris. It will be used to bring various cards into play and to buy spice and favor during the game. The house hoard is the area which contains the player's spice, an incredibly valuable resource which can be bought and sold throughout the game. Remember that a player needs a minimum of 10 spice to win the game. A player's imperial favor is a number that represents their house's esteem and influence throughout the assembly. This favor value will fluctuate during the game, rising when a house excels in accordance with the Lance Red conventions, and falling when it falters. Favor is unique among Spice and Solaris because a house's favor can go in the negatives, and there are some penalties a house must suffer if so. Remember that a player needs a minimum of 10 favor to win the game. 
To reiterate, this area is known as the House Reserves. The House deck will be drawn from over the course of the game, Solaris and the House Treasury will be used to buy various cards and resources, Spice from the House Hoard will be bought and sold, and Favor will go up and down based on the actions a house takes during the game. Depending on how players build their decks before the start of the game, players might have slightly different starting values for Solaris, Spice, and Favor. However, this is a part of deck building and will be covered in detail later. In this example, both players will start at the base values of 20 Solaris, 0 Spice, and 10 Favor. To continue setting up, both players also shuffle their Imperial cards, the ones with the blue back, and typically put it to the opposite side of their house reserves. This is known as the Imperial deck. Players will then draw three cards from their Imperial decks and lay them face down to form their assembly. The assembly is a set of three cards that players can petition to bring into play. Any face down cards can be viewed by the player that owns them at any time. Next to the Imperial deck is an Imperial discard, and the house profile, a document that will list starting house information that is determined before the start of the game during deck building. This area is known as the house forum. It contains the Imperial deck, assembly, Imperial Discard, and House Profile. Between the House Forum and the House Reserves is the House Domain, an area of play that represents the house's jurisdiction, and contains all of the personas, holdings, resources, and more used during the game. Since a homeworld is the initial location of the House Domain, both players start the game with their homeworld cards in play in their House Domains. Both players also begin the game with a Dune card in play subdued, which means face down. During setup, players will also need to set up the Chome Exchange, a shared location that contains the Guild Hoard and Imperial Treasury. The Guild Hoard is where players will buy and sell spice to and from, and the Imperial Treasury is where houses pay and receive Solaris. Like the other game zones mentioned, cards and rules will refer to these by name. To set up the Imperial Treasury, place at least 20 of a token denoting Solaris in a location accessible by all players. If the Imperial Treasury ever runs out of Solaris, simply add more Solaris to it and resume play. Setup for the Guild Hoard and related concepts will be covered later, but it is usually located next to the Imperial Treasury, since it too will be used by all players. Finally, all houses, or players, draw 7 cards from their house deck to form their opening hand of cards. Game setup is now finished, and to start the game all players begin the opening interval of the turn sequence. A turn in the Dune CCG is made up of three intervals, opening, house, and closing. The first and last, opening interval and closing interval, take place simultaneously for all houses, while the middle one, the house interval, occurs one at a time, in an order that is determined during the initiative phase of the opening interval. Let's go over each of the intervals and phases in order, starting with the opening interval. During the opening interval, houses disengage their cards for the coming turn, and determine the order of play for the rest of the turn. All houses do the following in order. Disengage Phase Each house may disengage their engaged cards, meaning they turn any sideways cards upright. If a card is prevented from being disengaged, due to some game effect, do not change its status. Next, the Deferment Phase Each house assigns one deferment token to each subdued card, meaning every card that is face down. However, face down assembly cards in the house forum are not considered subdued, and thus do not gain deferment tokens. Subdued cards and how to deploy them will be covered during the house interval. The initiative phase. Initiative rank determines the order that houses perform their house intervals, or in more common terms, the order that players take their turns. This phase has two steps, declaration and assignment. For declaration, each house declares its current favor. Declared Favor is current favor as modified by tactics and other effects. Cards that may affect Declared Favor do not change the actual current favor. Declared Favor is used solely for determining initiative. After declaring favor, assign initiative ranks. Proceeding from highest declared favor to lowest, each house is assigned an initiative rank. The house with the highest declared favor earns initiative rank 1. The second highest favor gains rank 2, and so on. 
If two or more houses tie for declared favor, all deadlocked houses discard the top card of their house deck. The house that discarded the card with the highest deployment cost wins the ranking, with subsequent ranks assigned from highest to lowest deployment cost. If the cards drawn are also tied, those still tied draw again, until the tie is broken. If the deployment cost of a card is X, count it as 10. During the first initiative phase of the game, the house with the lowest favor declares their favor first. Randomly pick a house in the case of a tie. In subsequent turns, the house who had the last initiative rank in the previous turn declares their favor first. To explain the initiative phase in short, houses declare their current favor value, which may be modified by cards in play or tactics played during this phase. The highest favor gets initiative rank 1, and the next highest gets 2, and so on. In the event of a tie, the tied houses discard the top card of their house deck, and the highest deployment cost wins the tie. After disengaging all cards, assigning deferment tokens, and determining initiative ranks, the house with the highest rank begins their house interval, and afterwards the house with the next highest rank takes theirs. Beginning with initiative rank 1, each house completes its house interval in turn. The activities allowed in a house interval are broadly grouped into general operations and restricted operations. Both can be performed in any order as they are not different segments of your house interval. One could, for example, perform a general operation, two restricted ones, and another general operation during a house interval. The difference between general and restricted operations is that you may only perform restricted operations a limited amount of times, whereas you may perform any number of general operations that you would like. Let's go over each general operation first. The Order of Petitioning is a diplomatic affair regulated by the Great Convention. During a petition, the Acting House sends representatives to lobby for aid in the form of Imperial allies, holdings, and decrees. The Imperial deck represents the assistance a house can acquire. The Assembly represents the resources available during the current session of the Imperial Assembly. The Order of Petitioning creates a bidding contest, in which houses dispute the deployment of a target ally, holding, or decree. Rival houses may contest this by tendering Solaris to increase the deployment cost of the card. A petitioning sequence begins when an eligible card is turned face up in the assembly, which are the three face down blue cards. This card may not have a deployment cost that is greater than the Solaris in the petitioner's house treasury. Imperial cards are unique, which means that this card may also not be already deployed by a rival. If a card has the native subtype, you must govern, meaning control, a dune fief before petitioning it. A starting bid at least equal to the deployment cost of the card must be entered. However, it cannot be higher than the amount of Solaris in the petitioner's house treasury. This bid is termed the standing deployment cost. Petitioning continues as a sequence of rounds in which the option is given to each house in turn, beginning with the petitioner and proceeding clockwise around the table. Each house exercises its option by declaring whether they will increase the bid or pass. To increase the bid, a house must simply declare a number of Solaris that is greater than the current standing deployment cost. If they do, this becomes the new standing deployment cost. As usual, no house may declare more Solaris than exists in its house treasury. Increasing the bid keeps that house active in the petitioning sequence, allowing them to increase or pass when the option once again returns. To pass, simply declare the intention. A house must pass if it does not have enough Solaris in its treasury to increase the standing deployment cost. Once a house has passed, it is removed from the petition entirely, and gains no further petition options. The petition ends once all houses pass in succession. The last house to increase the standing bid, or the petitioner if no one increased, is the victor. If the victor is the petitioner, the player who flipped the imperial card, the final deployment cost equals the full standing deployment cost. The petitioner pays the imperial treasury and deploys the card, placing it in their house domain in the engaged position. If the card has the same allegiance as the petitioner sponsor, the petitioner may opt to lose any amount of favor to reduce the card's final deployment cost by an equal amount. If the victor of the petition is a house other than the petitioner, the final deployment cost equals the standing deployment cost minus the deployment cost listed on the card. For example, if Smuggler Bribes is the card being petitioned, and the non-petitioner's house is the victor with a bid of 5, then that house must pay 2 Solaris to the Imperial Treasury. Once the non-petitioner victor pays the Imperial Treasury, the petitioner must immediately turn the target card face down in the position it previously held in the petitioner's assembly. 
Additionally, the petitioner may not initiate another petition for the remainder of its house interval. If for any reason the final deployment cost cannot be fully paid, for reasons such as insufficient funds, the victor must also reduce its favor by the number of unpaid Solaris. The card is still deployed if the petitioner was the victor. Effects that return a card to the assembly with no victor are considered to cancel that petition. Since the petition was not lost, but cancelled, another card in the assembly may be petitioned, subject to the effect on the card that caused the petition to be cancelled. In short, petitioning is taking a face-down Imperial card in your assembly and turning it face up, noting the Solaris cost in the top right-hand corner. Starting with you and going around the table in clockwise order, houses bid up on the card like an auction, starting with the Solaris cost of the card. Once someone declines to raise by passing, they cannot raise any more for the card. Houses cannot bid more than they have in Solaris. If the petitioner wins, then they pay the amount bid and the card enters play engaged. If an opposing house wins the bid, then they pay the difference between what they bid and the cost on the card. Failing to win the bid as the petitioner prevents you from being able to petition another card during the same house interval. Deploying a house card is one of the most common actions in the game, and the primary way to get your house cards into play. To deploy a house card, simply pay the deployment cost in Solaris and play it from hand into your house domain in the disengaged or upright position. Some cards may have a deployment restriction in their top right corner. There are two types, Allegiance and Talent. Cards with an Allegiance icon are affiliated with an Imperial power, and thus have certain restrictions and penalties on their deployment, such as a required loss of favor. Personas, homeworlds, charters, and personnel often have an Allegiance. The specific penalties involved will be described in the Allegiance section. A talent requirement indicates that the card must be assigned to, or used with, a card that has a talent rank at least equal to the requirement indicated. For example, a card with a talent requirement of 3 Intrigue may only be used by cards with an Intrigue talent at a rank of 3 or more. A card with the unique trait may not be deployed while any house has the same card currently deployed. The house wishing to deploy the unique card will have to wait until the other one is subdued or discarded before they can deploy it. Aids are not assigned to other cards, but may have cards assigned to them. A Dune Fief must be governed before deploying an aid with the native subtype. Resources include personnel, equipment, and enhancements. All are assigned to specific cards as written on the cards themselves. Personnel are assigned to personas or holdings where the number of deployed personnel assigned is not greater than the command rating of the target card. Enhancements and equipment are assigned to a variety of card types, and their legal targets will be written on the card. A resource may not be assigned to a subdued card. If a resource card has an allegiance, it may only be assigned to a card with the same allegiance or no allegiance. Some resources have limits restricting the number of duplicates that may be assigned to a single target. Such limits are written in the operation as limit followed by a number. For example, if a resource says limit 1, only one of that resource may be attached to an individual card. Once assigned, resources cannot be moved from one card to another without a card effect. Deploying Dune is the exception to this rule, and will be covered later. Ventures are missions that personas perform. They are deployed on a governed persona that meets the talent requirement and any other conditions that are described in the card's operation. Any number of ventures can be assigned to a given persona. Assigning the venture does nothing until the intent to engage its target persona is declared. This can be done immediately after deploying the venture, later that turn, or on a subsequent house interval. If a persona with a venture is captured or discarded, the house losing governance of the persona can transfer the venture to another eligible target. If there is no such eligible target, discard the venture. Tactics can alter the initiation, procedure, or outcome of operations. All tactics are deployed in reaction to something any house does. If two houses wish to deploy tactics at the same time, they do so in the order of initiative. Tactics must satisfy their requirements before they can be deployed. Dueling tactics can only be played by houses that are involved in that type of operation. Engagement tactics are deployed in response to any house engaging a card for any reason, and declaration tactics are deployed in response to any house declaring their intent to perform an operation, such as petition or deployment. All tactics are discarded once their effects have been resolved. To understand tactics better, it may be helpful to think of them like so. Every time you try to do something, you first declare what you will do, and afterwards you resolve what you do. 
Thus, any tactic declaration card can be played during any house's turn, when they declare what they are doing. Rights and initiative are two phases of the game that explicitly have declaration phases, and some cards can only be played during these phases. For example, tactic, intrigue, declaration are noted for play during the declaration phases of an intrigue right, and tactic, initiative, declaration is noted for play during the initiative phase of the opening interval. Declaration tactics with no subtype may only be deployed during the house interval. They may not be deployed during the opening or closing intervals. In summary, to deploy a house card from hand, you must first pay its Solaris cost, and then deploy it into your house domain, disengaged. Depending on what type of card it is, there may be additional rules on where and when specifically you can deploy it. When deploying an aid, put it into play with your other personas. When deploying a resource, such as a personnel, equipment, or enhancement, attach it to a card. The resource will describe what types of cards it can attach to. A persona or holding can never have more personnel cards attached to it than its command, which is the number in the lower left corner of the card. When deploying a tactic, deploy it only during the interval that it's marked for. For example, an arbitration engagement tactic can only be played during the engagement phases of an arbitration right. Likewise, an initiative declaration tactic can only be played during the opening phase when houses are declaring their initiative. It's important to note that tactics can be deployed during other houses' house intervals. When deploying a venture, deploy it by paying its cost and attaching it to an eligible persona. The venture remains in play until discarded from being used, or by a card effect. Here's an example of deploying a card. The Atreides-sponsored house would like to play a house battalion. The card's operation reads that you assign it to a target persona or fief. Fortunately, this house has a Gurney Halleck in play. House Battalion's talent requirement is Battle Zero, meaning that the card that it is assigned to must have at least zero in the battle talent. Keep in mind that not having a battle icon is not the same as having a battle rank of zero. The house pays the cost of the House Battalion, and assigns it to Gurney Halleck. Gurney Halleck has a command limit of two, so he may be assigned one more personnel. Because deploying a house card is a general operation during the house interval, the Atreides-sponsored house may deploy additional cards afterwards, or after a separate general or restricted operation. If a subdued, non-event card has been assigned at least one deferment token, it may be deployed. However, a subdued card cannot be deployed while assigned to another subdued card. To deploy a non-event subdued card, pay the difference between its deployment cost and the number of deferment tokens that are assigned, and deploy it in the disengaged, meaning upright, position. The card is now in play, and may be engaged to generate effects or be targeted by other effects. Once a subdued card has been assigned deferment tokens equal to its deployment cost, it must be deployed during your house interval, unless prohibited by a card effect or game rule, such as unique or the card being an event. Event cards must secure the full value of their deployment cost and deferment tokens before being deployed. You cannot use Solaris to deploy an event card. Deploying events will be covered in detail in the Restricted Operations section. It is important to note that subdued Imperial cards in the house domain do not need to be repetitioned. They are deployed from being subdued as any other card. Cards become subdued over the course of the game from card effects or from becoming vanquished, meaning being applied enough force equal or greater than the resistance value. Remember that at the start of each opening interval during the deferment phase, each subdued card occurs a deferment token. So eventually over the course of many turns, your subdued cards become cheaper to play. However, they must have at least one deferment token on them before you deploy them from being subdued. For example, in a previous turn, the Atreides-sponsored house had their Paul Atreides vanquished in battle. Since then, the subdued Paul has acquired three deferment tokens. During their house interval, the house decides to deploy Paul. Paul Atreides has a cost of four, and the three deferment tokens reduce this cost by three, meaning the house has to only pay one Solaris to the treasury to deploy Paul in the disengaged position. Once again, it is important to note that to deploy a non-event card from Subduel, the card must have at least one deferment token on it. Before they can be deployed, events must first be placed subdued. During your house interval, you may place as many face-down events from hand as you wish. To do so, simply place an event card from your hand into your house domain face-down. Placement is free of cost, and the events secure deferment tokens normally. 
While placing a subdued event is a general operation and can be done as often as you wish, deploying a subdued event is a restricted operation and can only be done once a house interval. How to deploy events will be covered in the restricted operation section. Programs remain concealed beneath the homeworld until deployed, but they are not played during regular play. Instead, they are a part of your house profile, which is created before the start of the game as a part of deck building. Programs also become subdued whenever their parent card becomes subdued, unlike other similar cards. They also never become discarded, and are instead removed from the game entirely when an effect or rule removes them. To deploy a program, engage the homeworld and assign the program to a governed persona. This persona must have either no allegiance, or the same allegiance as the program assigned. If a deployed program finds that its assigned persona gains an incompatible allegiance, nothing occurs. However, if the program is later subdued, it cannot be redeployed whilst the allegiance incompatibility exists. Programs always contain information in their operation about when to add program tokens to the card. Programs also bear an X deployment cost, where X equals the number of program tokens assigned. Even if no program tokens are assigned, subdued programs must be assigned at least one deferment token in order to be deployed. Most cards have an operation. You may engage or turn sideways a card to execute the operation written in its operation description. If the operation describes a tactic, it may only be engaged during the appropriate interval, phase, or write. Some cards must be engaged to produce their effects, while others do not. Cards that produce effects without engaging do so even if they are engaged. Many holdings produce spice or solaris when engaged. When engaging to produce spice, create new spice tokens. Do not take the spice tokens from the guild hoard or anywhere else in the game. However, when producing Solaris, take them from the Imperial Treasury. Ventures are deployed on a Persona during your house interval. While played normally, they remain on the Persona until you engage them during your turn to use the Venture, after which the operation on the Venture produces its effects. After the Venture is used once, it is discarded. Programs gain tokens each time the condition described in its operation becomes fulfilled. As the number of assigned tokens increase, usually so do the rewards generated upon their initiation and resolution. While subdued, programs cease to operate and cannot gain additional tokens. While a program is deployed and has at least one program token assigned, its assigned persona may be engaged to activate the program just like a venture. Resolve the effects in the venture portion of the program's operation. Upon resolution, discard all assigned tokens and remove the program from play, not in the Imperial Discard. Most homeworlds have a similar Solaris producing operation, so you will be engaging it each turn for a consistent income. However, if desired, you can instead govern Dune, but it will replace your starting homeworld. During game setup, all houses begin the game with their homeworld and Dune, which starts subdued, in their house domain. If a house comes to govern Dune, whether through deploying it as any other subdued card or through other methods, that house must immediately subdue its homeworld. Dune becomes their new homeworld, but unlike other homeworlds, Dune is unique, meaning no other house may deploy Dune while someone governs it. When a house governs Dune, it also gains allegiance to their house sponsor, losing all other allegiances. An important rule to remember is that the old homeworld may only be redeployed if Dune becomes subdued. Keep in mind that you may not deploy Dune or any Imperial card if someone already has it in play because they are unique regardless of how many deferment tokens you have on them. So when an opposing house has Dune governed, yours will still accure deferment tokens. It's possible for Dune to have 8, 10, or even 20 deferment tokens before you can deploy it. When Dune becomes a house's new homeworld, transfer all cards assigned directly or indirectly from the old homeworld to Dune, providing Dune can be legally assigned these cards. Also transfer all concealed programs. Transferred cards retain their current status, such as engaged or subdued. Cards that may not be transferred remain assigned to the old homeworld. If the original homeworld is redeployed, transfer all cards assigned to Dune back to the original homeworld, assuming it is a legal target. Admission to the High Council is the objective of the game, and any house that successfully does so wins the game. 
A request for admission to the Landsride High Council may only be made by a house currently possessing at least 10 spice in their hoard and at least 10 favor. To request, declare the intent by either engaging a governed ally with the house sponsor's allegiance or the house's current home world. During this operation, if the ally or homeworld engages for any other reason, the request is aborted. Otherwise, the declared target is engaged, and the house's request is accepted, winning the game. While Dune is governed, Dune becomes the house's homeworld. Therefore, the original homeworld cannot be engaged to request admission. Restricted operations, like general operations, may be performed in any order, but only a limited number of times. The amount of times that you can perform a restricted operation will vary, based on the specific operation taken. There are two types of events, Imperium and Dune. A house must govern a homeworld to deploy an Imperium event. Likewise, a house must govern a Dune Fief to deploy a Dune event. Governing Dune fulfills the requirements for deploying both Imperium and Dune events. Only one Imperium event and one Dune event may be deployed per house interval. Events deployed outside of the house interval do not count towards this limit. When an eligible event has occurred deferment tokens equal to or greater than its deployment cost, or at least one token in the case of an event with an X cost, it may be deployed during the house interval by discarding the accured tokens and turning it face up in its current location. Unlike other subdued cards, Solaris cannot be paid to deploy an event with insufficient deferment tokens. Once deployed, the event generates its described effect immediately, and must be discarded once its effect is resolved. Events with duration effects last throughout the remaining house intervals, and are discarded during the house discard phase. Nexus events are a bit different. Their effects begin when deployed, but resolve on a later turn. Do not remove deferment tokens from Nexus events when deployed. Instead, remove one token during the house discard phase. Discard the Nexus event when the last token is removed. Favor is one of the three main resources alongside Spice and Solaris. Favor is used for card effects and in some cases, card costs. Additionally, you will need at least 10 Favor to fulfill the Favor requirement of the Landsraad provisions, which, if met with the other requirements, wins the game. During a house interval, a house may increase its Favor by as much as 5 points, by paying 2 Solaris to the Imperial Treasury per point of Favor increased. As it is a restricted operation, regardless of the number of favor bought, only one by favor operation may be conducted during the house interval. Favor is a valuable resource, and there are penalties that will be described later for having negative favor. More importantly, you will need at least 10 favor to fulfill the favor requirement of the Landstrad provisions, which, if met with the other requirements, wins the game. The Chome Exchange is the primary source of two out of the three main resources, Spice and Solaris. This area of play contains the Imperial Treasury and the Guild Horde, and both are set up during game setup. As Spice is the most precious commodity in the universe, its value will change throughout the game based on how much of it is in the Guild Horde. To set up the Guild Horde during game setup, place four Spice tokens, then an additional two more per player. For a two-player game, this will be eight Spice total, 10 Spice for a three-player game, and so on. The current rate of exchange, or CROE as it's referred to on most cards, is the number of Solaris that each Spice token is worth when being bought and sold. This number will fluctuate throughout the game, going up when Spice in the Guild Horde is scarce, and lowering when it's plentiful. The starting CROE depends on the number of Spice tokens in the Guild Horde at the start of the game. The chart shown here describes what the exchange rate is per however many Spice tokens are in the Guild Horde. When starting a 2-player game, 8 Spice tokens will be in the Guild Horde, meaning the CROE will begin at 3. Note that the exchange rate cannot go below 1 or higher than 6, so during play a 6-sided die may be used to keep track of this number. To help visualize the relationship between the exchange rate and the number of spice, it's recommended to arrange the spice tokens in sets of three. Starting at six, every set of three spice tokens in the Guild Horde reduces the exchange rate by one, and after four sets of three, the CROE will be one. During its house interval, a house may either buy or sell up to three spice tokens, but not both. A Chome exchange is done in one transaction, meaning a house may not buy or sell one spice token, perform some other operation, and then buy or sell another spice token. 
Additionally, as it is a restricted operation, only one Chome exchange may be conducted during the house interval. Cards that give an additional Chome exchange grant another complete transaction, separate and independent from the first. To buy spice during your house interval, declare the total number of spice tokens to be bought, with a maximum of three. Pay to the Imperial Treasury Solaris equal to the current rate of exchange, and transfer the first or only spice token from the Guild Hoard to your House Hoard. If the number of spice tokens in the Guild Hoard indicates a new current rate of exchange, adjust the number or die to reflect the new rate after each individual token is bought. Repeat this process for the number of declared spice tokens to be bought. Spice may not be purchased if the guild hoard is empty, and after declaring, a house is forced to buy the declared number of spice tokens as long as it can with its available funds. To sell spice during your house interval, declare the total number of spice tokens to be sold with a maximum of three. Transfer the first spice token from the house hoard to the guild hoard, and collect from the Imperial Treasury Solaris equal to the current rate of exchange. Adjust the current rate of exchange after each individual spice token is sold. If the number of spice tokens in the guild hoard indicates a new current rate of exchange, adjust the number or die to reflect the new rate. Repeat this process for the number of declared spice to be sold. Keep in mind that the guild hoard is shared between all houses, so purchasing spice will make it more expensive for opposing houses to buy in future turns, and selling it will make it cheaper. To summarize, once a turn, you may elect to either buy or sell spice to the Chome Exchange. However, you may not do both, and you may not buy or sell more than three spice at a time. During a transaction, after buying or selling each token, you must check the current rate of exchange, or CROE, to see if the price changes, and update the CROE if it does. Remember that the more spice at the Chome Exchange, the less it's worth, and the less spice in the exchange, the more valuable it is. Spice is an important and necessary commodity, as you will need at least 10 spice to fulfill the wealth requirement of the Lance Ride provisions, which, if met alongside the other requirements, wins you the game. Conflict lies at the heart of the Imperium. The Greek Convention provides formal rules for resolving house conflicts without harming innocents. These rules, the forms of Canley, dictate the types of aggression permitted and the processes involved. The forms of Canley sanction four methods for settling disputes among the houses. These ritual forms are called rites, and each has its own flavor and purpose. In a dueling rite, two personas engage in personal combat to settle issues of house honor. In a battle rite, rival houses use troops to contest the governance of a territorial fief. In an arbitration right, rival house delegates refute the appointment of economic charters. And in an intrigue right, house operatives undermine or eliminate members of a rival house through assassination and deception. These four rights are grouped into two categories, Lancerad rights and Chome rights. Dueling and battle are Lancerad rights, while arbitration and intrigue are Chome rights. To avoid full-scale warfare, a house may only perform one Lancerad Rite and one Chome Rite against each rival during their house interval. Rites initiated by ventures count against this house limit, unless the venture's operation states otherwise. Each type of Rite can also only target certain cards, as shown in this chart. For example, a battle Rite can only be initiated against a fief, and both sides will use the battle talent to determine the outcome. All rights are resolved in three intervals, which are then further subdivided into segments. During a right, the initiating house is the attacker, and the rival house is the defender. All rights are initiated by personas or card effects. The initiation interval consists of declaration and engagement, and proceeds in segments from the attacker to the defender. The acting house states a type of right to initiate and declares a disengaged persona that they govern possessing the required right talent at a rank of zero or better to be the attack leader. If the right was initiated by a card effect, the persona to be engaged to produce the card effect is the leader. Name any assigned personnel to the attack leader as additional participants as desired. However, they must meet the same requirements as the leader. That is, they must be disengaged and possess the required talent of the right, or have some other card text that specifically allows them to participate. Next, name a rival's card as the target of the right. To be eligible, a target must be a valid target governed by another house. An important rule to remember also is that the target of the right must not possess the same allegiance as the right leader. Unlike the attacker, the target of the right does not need to be disengaged, nor must it have the same talent. For example, any persona can be the target of a duel, no matter how bad they are with a sword. 
Starting with the defender and proceeding clockwise, each house in turn may deploy a declaration tactic. This process continues until no one wishes to deploy any further tactics. The attacking and defending houses may only deploy declaration tactics specific to the right, such as cards that list battle, intrigue, arbitration, or dueling in their subtype. If there are other houses in the game, they may deploy non-specific declaration tactics during the attacker declaration segment. Afterwards, once the segment has ended, only the attacking and defending houses may deploy tactics later in the right. As normal, discard all tactics as they are resolved except for duration effects. Duration effect tactics remain assigned until the end of the right, and may be targeted by other tactics. Engage all declared attack participants. If for any reason the attack leader cannot engage, abort the right. Aborted rights do not count toward the house interval's right limit. Starting with the defender and if they would like to, the two houses involved may alternate deploying engagement tactics. Discard all tactics as they are resolved except for duration effects. Duration effect tactics remain assigned until the end of the right, and may be targeted by other tactics. The defending house declares the target of the right as the defense leader, and this leader may be a charter or fief. Declare any personnel assigned to the defense leader as additional participants as desired. Such personnel must possess the talent appropriate to the right. Personnel that did not participate are not affected by the results of the right. Following this, there is a similar window to deploy declaration tactics starting with the attacker. The defending house may now engage the defense leader. However, if the leader is already engaged, the right still proceeds normally. Following this, there is another window to deploy engagement tactics, starting with the attacker. The assessment interval begins after all participants and tactics have been engaged and deployed. No further tactics can be deployed until after the end of the right. Next, both houses declare their force total. To do so, add together the required talent ranks of each participant to arrive at a number. This number is the force total. Include any modifiers generated by tactics or special operations. If a card ends up participating in a right for which it does not have the required talent, it adds no force to its side's force total. Personnel that did not engage to participate in the right have no effect on the right, and do not add any force whatsoever during force calculation or distribution. This means that during the defender engagement step, if the defending house chose or could not engage the defense leader, their leader generates no force during the assessment interval, but still receives force as normal during resolution. If any additional defense participants were declared, they are no longer considered participants and cannot engage, even if otherwise eligible. Each house distributes their force total among the participating targets in the opposing group. The attacker distributes force first, followed by the defender. Force may not be distributed to cards with assigned participants unless those assigned participants receive sufficient force to vanquish them. Personnel cards that did not participate in a right have no effect on the right, and thus do not need to be vanquished before the card they are assigned to can be vanquished. If a card defends in a right for which it is not an eligible target, it still receives force normally and may be vanquished. With some exceptions, during the resolution interval participants resolve their applied force simultaneously. A card is vanquished if the force applied to it equals or exceeds its total resistance. Vanquished cards are immediately subdued. Ignore any force applied to a participant that is less than its resistance. The Great Convention rewards success in sanctioned rights, but only the attacking house gains this reward, and only if the original target was vanquished, regardless of if the attack leader was also vanquished. Some cards may change the defense leader during a right through a special operation called counter. During the resolution interval, if a countering target was subdued, no bonus is awarded to the attacker. When successful in a lance red right, the attacking house may either increase its favor or decrease the defending house's favor by an amount equal to the total number of defense participants vanquished during the right. When successful in a chome right, the attacking house may either produce Solaris in its treasury or force the defending house to discard Solaris from its treasury, equal to twice the total number of defense participants vanquished. The defender is not required to pay Solaris more than exists in their treasury. Following the resolution interval, the right is now complete, and the attacking house may continue its house interval as normal. Here is a summary of a right. As a reminder, you may only initiate one lance red and one chome right against each rival house. Declare your attack leader. They must be disengaged and must have the talent required for the type of right you are performing. Declare what card is the target. The target must be the right kind for the right and cannot be the same allegiance as the attack leader, unless they are both unaligned. Any personnel on the attack leader that are able to participate are also declared during the step. 
Afterwards, engage the attack leader. If the attack leader was somehow engaged during the attacker declaration, then the right is called off unless the right was begun by engaging the leader to use a venture. All other attacking persona are also engaged. Any personnel on the attack leader may be engaged to use their abilities, which will usually add to the talent rank of the leader. Next, the defender declares the defense leader. Normally this is the persona, charter, or fief being attacked. Any personnel on the defense leader that are to participate are declared during this step. Then, any defending personas are engaged if they are not so already. The right does not end if the defense leader is already engaged. Any attached personnel are also engaged if they have the ability to join in on the attack. Add up the participating card's talent ratings on both sides. This value is the force total each side has. Certain effects may modify this force. Starting with the attacker, each participant declares their number. Then, starting with the attacker, the participants apply the force they have generated to the opponent's cards, aiming to apply an amount that is equal to the card's resistance value, the number in the lower right corner. A card with personnel that have been engaged to participate in this battle cannot have any force applied to them until enough force have been applied to each personnel participating. This means that it's sometimes worthwhile to engage a personnel just to prevent the leader from being dealt enough force to be vanquished. Any card with force applied to it equal to its resistance is vanquished, meaning unless a card effect states otherwise, it is subdued. Any card without enough force applied to it suffers no penalty. If this were a lance rad right, meaning a duel or battle right, and the original target of the right was vanquished, then the attacker may either increase their favor by the number of defense participants vanquished during the right, or decrease the favor of the defender by the same amount. If the defense leader was not the original target of the right, then there is no reward or penalty. If this were a chome right, meaning an arbitration or intrigue right, and the original target of the right was vanquished, then the attacker may either increase the Solaris and their treasury by twice the number of defense participants vanquished during the right, or decrease the Solaris and the treasury of the defender by the same amount. If the defense leader was not the original target of the right, then there is no reward or penalty. The right has now concluded, and the attacking house continues their house interval as normal. Here is an example of a battle right. The Atreides sponsored house would like to have their Duncan Idaho battle the rival governed Carthag. Duncan Idaho has an Atreides battalion assigned as well as a stunner. Both will help him in this battle right but in different ways. The rival governed Carthag has a Harkonnen battalion assigned to it. It is the Atreides sponsored house house interval, and they announce that they would like to initiate their one allotted Landsrad right against the Harkonnen sponsored house. They start with Attack Declaration, declaring Duncan Idaho as the attack leader. Duncan has both the required talent for the right and is disengaged, so he is a suitable leader. During this step, they also declare that the Atreides Battalion will be participating in this right as well. Attack engagement then occurs, and all attacking participants, in this case Duncan Idaho and the Atreides Battalion, engage. Next, Defense Declaration happens. The rival house declares Carthag as the defense leader, and the Harkonnen Battalion as an additional participant. The battalion have the appropriate talent for the right, so they may be included. All defending participants, Carthag and the Harkonnen Battalion, engage during the defender engagement step. After each step, starting with the attacker, houses may deploy tactics. After this defender engagement step, the Atreides-sponsored house deploys Fog of Battle, an engagement tactic with a duration effect, meaning it will stay assigned until the end of the current right. Fog of Battle is assigned to the leader, so the Atreides-sponsored house assigns it to Duncan Idaho. The operation of Fog of Battle reads, When distributing force, you may divide your force among opposing participants as you wish, ignoring the normal order of distribution. This tactic will help Duncan Idaho vanquish Carthag during the assessment interval. After the initiation interval is over, we move on to the assessment interval. Remember that no further tactics can be deployed after the initiation interval, until after the end of the right. In force calculation, both houses declare their force total. Remember that when calculating force total, you are only counting the relevant talent for the right. In this case, the talent is battle, so each side counts up their total battle force. The Atreides-sponsored side counts one for Duncan, adding two from the battalion, and an extra two from the stunner that is assigned, for a grand total of five force for this right. The Harkonnen-sponsored house counts two from Carthag, and adds three from the battalion that is assigned, for a grand total of five force. Next, force distribution happens. Attackers distribute their force first, and then defenders. However, the force is still applied at the same time during the resolution interval. 
The attacking house deployed a fog of battle earlier, which lets it distribute its force ignoring the normal order of distribution. This means that instead of having to distribute enough force to vanquish any participating personnel first, in this case the battalion, the attacker may instead distribute all of their force on the Carthag first. Because the attacking house generated only 5 force this turn, and they initiated the right with the goal of subduing Carthag, they put all of their force onto the Dune Fief. The defending house has enough force to vanquish both the battalion and Duncan. Because they have to, they first distribute 2 force to vanquish the battalion, and then 3 onto Duncan. Now that the effect of fog of battle has resolved, the tactic is now discarded. Finally, the resolution interval happens simultaneously for all participating houses. Because they have force on them that is equal to or more than their listed resistance, the Atreides-sponsored house subdues Duncan and his assigned Atreides battalion. The assigned stunner remains deployed and attached to the subdued Duncan. Carthag also had enough force distributed to it this right, so it also becomes subdued. The battalion remains assigned to it. In a later part of the game when Duncan or Carthag are redeployed from Subduel, the Battalion or the Stunner may continue to produce their effects immediately. Lastly, the Attacking House gains rewards for the Lancerad right because the original target, Carthag, was vanquished. Because the Attacking House only vanquished one participant on the right, they may increase their favor by one or decrease the Rival House's favor by one. They decide to increase their favor by one. The right is now fully concluded, and the Atreides-sponsored House interval resumes. They initiated their one Lancerad right against the Harkonnen-sponsored house, and may not initiate another Lancerad, meaning battle or dueling, right. However, they may initiate a Chom right if they wish. The house interval concludes whenever the house whose interval it is finishes all of their desired general and restricted operations. Afterwards, the house with the next highest initiative rank performs their house interval. After all houses have performed their house intervals, all houses move to the closing interval. The closing interval consists of two phases, and, like in the opening interval, houses perform these phases simultaneously in order. Assembly Administration Phase First, houses discard any number of unwanted cards in their assembly. If the assembly contains more cards than the assembly limit, discard the excess. Unless altered by a card in play, a house's assembly limit is 3 cards. All discards are placed face up. Throughout the game, discard piles are not kept secret and may be examined by other houses at any time, maintaining the order of cards. After discarding, each house draws cards from its Imperial deck and places them face down in its assembly. A house may only draw cards up to the assembly limit. Drawing cards during this phase is optional, and if cards run out while drawing, there is no penalty. Hand Administration Phase Each house may discard any number of cards from its hand. If a house holds more cards than its hand limit, discard down to the limit. Unless altered by a card in play, the hand limit is 7. Next, discard one deferment token from any Nexus events, and discard any Nexus events without any tokens. Then, each house must draw cards from the house deck up to its hand limit. However, a house with a favor of 0 or less may not draw cards. If a house cannot fill its hand to the hand limit, it is eliminated from the game. Remove all of its cards and tokens from play. If a rival governs cards owned by an eliminated house, discard them as if during a right. Thus, a house entering the closing interval with a lack of cards in its house deck, but enough cards in its hand to satisfy the hand limit, can continue playing normally. After completing the closing interval, the opening interval begins again. All houses go through the disengage phase, deferment phase, and then determine new initiative ranks. Play then continues with the house interval in order of initiative ranks, then closing interval, opening interval again, and so on. Houses keep going through all of the intervals until a house successfully passes admission to the High Council, and as a result, wins the game. Each Imperial power represents a select group that wields enormous influence. The Imperial powers in the Lancerad are House Carino, House Atreides, and House Harkonnen. Alternatively, the Spacing Guild, the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, and the Fremen emerge as powerful groups in Chome. Finally, the Spice Miners Guild, the Water Sellers Union, and the Dune Smugglers are not recognized in any official sense, but they have strong leverage among the many houses that rely on Arakeen commerce. Choose a benefactor carefully, for each power has its own strengths, foibles, and enemies. House Carino 
The royal family of the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV exerts tremendous influence in the Lansred and Chom. House Carino maintains its supremacy through extreme caution, employing its dreaded legions of Sardaukar when all other measures have been exhausted. House Atreides Led by Duke Leto, House Atreides enjoys great popularity among the great houses, and serves as the informal speaker of the Lansrad High Council. Not among the wealthiest of the great houses, House Atreides maintains greatness through its reputation for justice and honor. House Harkonnen Directed by the Baron Vladimir, House Harkonnen has risen in power through its immense wealth and naked ambition. House Harkonnen fosters a long-standing enmity with House Atreides, and conspires to bring an end to the Atreides line, with the death of Leto and his only heir, Paul. The Spacing Guild Represented by Oberon, a third-stage navigator, the guild enjoys a monopoly over interstellar space travel. Though it carefully guards its neutrality, the guild views the political meddling of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood as a serious threat. The Bene Gesserit Sisterhood the Emperor's own truthsayer, Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim, helps the Sisterhood control imperial affairs, through political conniving and show membership. An ancient school built upon esoteric ways, the Sisterhood has developed a program for selective breeding and human development, to produce the Kwisatz Haderach, the super-being who may be in many places at once. The Fremen Guided by their mysterious leader Leia, the Fremen are mistakenly regarded as a populace of scattered tribesmen, dispersed among the cities and urban fringes of the planet Arrakis. Officially recognized as neither a Landsrad nor a Chom power, the Fremen are the true wardens of Dune, secretly controlling most of the affairs that occur on planet. The Spice Miners Guild A group of veteran spice workers under the guidance of director Ormi Barikin. This is a force not to be crossed. Only the Fremen know the ways of the worm, as do the miners. If this group of hardened desert harvesters were to strike, the flow of spice would stop, and the Imperium would find itself rapidly brought to its knees. The Water Cellars Union Arrakis may be the center of the universe, but the center of every Arakeen city is the Water Cellars domain. Everyone on the planet is trapped between the scorching sun and the merciless sands, and water is as precious as air to those who work here. And rest assured, if Lingar Butte, their leader, could charge for air, he would. Dune Smugglers Deep in the recesses of Tuik CH, Esmar Tuik leads his followers among the cities like the Fremen move among the dunes. He recognizes no imperial overlord, and will bend his knee to no so-called great house. For he knows the houses may hold great wealth, but people like him actually earn it. Every Imperial power has at least one other power bent on its destruction. Such powers are also your adversaries. The chart shown here lists the adversaries of each Imperial sponsor. If your adversaries are involved, certain rules may become affected. For example, when building your Imperial deck, you may not include any cards with allegiance to your sponsor's adversaries. Cards with an allegiance icon are affiliated with an Imperial power, and have certain restrictions and penalties on their deployment. Personas, homeworlds, charters, and personnel often have an allegiance. As a reminder, a card with allegiance to an imperial power can only be assigned to cards with the same allegiance or no allegiance. There are three main rules to remember regarding allegiances and adversaries that will come up commonly during play. First, when deploying an assembly card after a successful petition that bears allegiance to the house sponsor, the final deployment cost may be reduced by one Solari for each favor discarded. This is commonly referred to as House Advantage, and it does not affect bidding. As usual, no bid may exceed the Solaris amount in the House Treasury. Favor may not be used to reduce the cost of House cards deployed from one's hand. The second rule is, you must lose one favor whenever a card bearing allegiance to a non-adversarial Imperial power, other than the sponsoring power, is deployed. This includes deployment after petition, subduel, and from one's hand. The third rule is, whenever a card bearing an adversarial allegiance is deployed for any reason, lose favor equal to its printed deployment cost. In summary, when deploying a card from a petition, subduel, or one's hand, check the allegiance. During a petition, if the allegiance matches your house sponsor, the deployment cost may be reduced by one Solaris for each favor discarded. During other kinds of deployment or a petition, if the allegiance does not match and is a non-adversarial allegiance to your sponsor, then lose one favor when deploying. And finally, if the allegiance is an adversary to your sponsor, then you must lose favor equal to the deployment cost, in addition to its regular cost. 
a card that changes allegiance depending on a certain condition, and has that condition already met prior to deploying or petitioning, is deployed as though it already had the new, or dual, allegiance. If an already deployed card finds it is now assigned to a card with an incompatible allegiance, it is not subdued or discarded. Allegiance restrictions are only checked during deployment. Thus, if it is subdued, it cannot be redeployed whilst the allegiance incompatibility exists. A persona that gains or adopts a new allegiance now has two allegiances. Both allegiances are subject to all regular allegiance rules. During a write, cards may have special engagement operations that will affect the outcome. Here are some common ones. Surprise. Surprise allows you to apply your force during the resolution interval, with the goal of vanquishing the cards before they can apply their force to yours. Any participant with Surprise can distribute and resolve its contributing force against opposing participants first. Participants that are vanquished by this force cannot add force to their group's force total. If both houses use Surprise during a write, the house with the lowest initiative rank resolves its Surprise force first. Capture Capture allows a house to take control of a target write participant, becoming its governor. Personas that can capture vanquished participants do so only if they are neither vanquished nor discarded during the write, or if their capture ability is described as a tactic that takes effect before write resolution. To resolve a capture, transfer the target to the captor's house domain. If it is a resource, immediately subdue it and assign it to a persona or holding in the new house domain. If the target possesses adversarial allegiance, subdue it regardless. Otherwise, the target retains its current status. Capturing a persona allied to another imperial power has no impact on a house's adversaries. If the target has any enhancements or tokens assigned, they remain assigned. Any spice and deferment tokens assigned to a captured subdued card also remain assigned. Personnel, equipment, and program cards assigned to the target remain with their former governor, who must immediately transfer them to eligible targets. If no eligible target exists, discard them. Or if they are programs, they are instead removed from play. Many cards that allow capture are duration effects, but this means that the card lingers before producing its effect. This is not a limit on the capture, which is still permanent. As a reminder, Homeworlds and Dune are immune to capture and discard effects. Discard Discard operations cause a participant vanquished during a write to be discarded from play rather than subdued. Discard the target to its owner's appropriate discard pile. If the target had any assigned enhancements or tokens, discard them as well. Personnel and equipment must immediately be transferred to eligible targets. If no eligible targets remain, they must also be discarded. Direct A write leader with the ability to direct allows additional personas to be declared as participants of the write. These additional personas must have a total command rank less than that of the directing persona. For instance, a directing leader with a command rank of 4 could bring 3 additional personas of rank 1, or 2 of ranks 2 and 1, or 1 of rank 3. All additional personas brought into the right by the directing leader must also be disengaged, and must possess the same allegiance as the leader or no allegiance. Eligible personnel assigned to these additional personas may also be included as participants, and they are assigned during the attacker declaration step of the initiation interval. Likewise, a defense leader with the ability to direct allows additional personas to be declared as participants during the defender declaration step. During force distribution, the directing leader cannot have any force applied to them until all of the personnel and personas they brought into the right have had as much force applied to them as their resistance. For example, the Glossu Raban card has the ability to direct in battle rights. When he leads a battle right, he may use that direct ability to include other personas in play. If Piter de Vries is already deployed and not engaged, Raban can direct Piter into battle as a participant. The talent of the right is not required to be on the directed personas. Piter does not have the battle talent to apply additional force to the attack, but he is providing additional resistance to keep Raban from being dealt force first. Raban has a command of two, and Piter's is only one, so he may join the right. Raban wouldn't be able to include, for example, Ike and Nefud, since they both have a command value of 2. It's important to not confuse directed personas with participating personnel. Although the directed personas are technically participating in the right, participating personnel are not being directed themselves, since they were already assigned to the leader before the right was initiated. Additionally, remember that already assigned personnel cards don't reduce the parent card's command when it needs to direct more participants into the right. Counter. 
Counter operations allow the defense to change the target of the right to the persona countering during the attacker engagement step. The countering persona becomes the new defense leader, regardless of their eligibility to be the target for that right. Meaning, for example, a persona could become the target of an arbitration or battle right. A countering persona must be disengaged, and must have a different allegiance from the attack leader or no allegiance. A persona targeted by a right cannot counter. If the defender successfully counters an attack and has its countering leader vanquished, the attacker will not gain the rewards for a successful right, since the original target of the right was changed. The advantage to countering is that you do not have to engage the card to declare the counter. As previously mentioned in Defender Engagement, engaging your defense leader in a right is optional. So it becomes possible to counter every attack that comes at you without ever engaging the persona that is performing the counter, assuming it never gets subdued or engaged. Here are some additional optional rules. As a courtesy, make sure your opponents are aware and agree to any and all optional rules you choose to play with before the start of the game. Overwhelming Control of Arrakis As an additional victory condition, if a house possesses at least one favor and governs Dune, Arakeen, Carthag, the Imperial Basin, the Minor Erg, and the Open Bled, it may force admission to the High Council by engaging each of the six fiefs, demonstrating its overwhelming control of Arrakis. If any of these fiefs become engaged for any other reason, the attempt fails and play continues. Surrender Initiative During initiative declaration, a house with declared favor equal to a rival may voluntarily surrender initiative allowing the rival to win the tie. If accepted, neither house draws cards, while the house surrendering initiative gains one favor after all rankings have been assigned. Chome Obligation Neglecting to promptly reset the current rate of exchange when instructed to do so incurs a loss of one favor. A house is considered negligent once it begins any action unrelated to the operation pertaining to the current rate of exchange. Event Deployment Events with deferment tokens equal to their deployment cost must either be deployed or discarded during your house interval. Events with an X deployment cost must be deployed once they have deferment tokens equal to their maximum deployment cost, if one is listed in their operation. Houses may not violate their interval maximums to deploy such events, but instead must choose which to deploy and then discard the remainder. Deploying Tactics in Multiplayer Games any house may deploy tactics during a right, regardless of whether the house governs one or more participants in the right. The house profile refers to the document that contains information such as house name, sponsor, homeworld, and starting point. Constructing your house and imperial deck has several restrictions. It is recommended to first pick an Imperial power as a sponsor, and then a homeworld aligned with that power. Afterwards, construct your Imperial deck first, and then build your house deck around it. Lastly, you may come up with a personalized house name. The Imperial deck must contain 10 or more cards, not including Dune. Cards with adversarial allegiance may not be included. If cards are included with allegiance to another non-adversarial Imperial power, no cards with allegiance to that power's adversaries may be included either. Since Imperial cards are unique, there can be no duplicates in the deck. The house deck must contain 30 or more cards. Cards bearing no allegiance or cards sharing allegiance with any card included in the Imperial deck may be included. A house card with an allegiance can only be included in the house deck if an Imperial card of the same allegiance exists in the Imperial deck. No more than four of any one card by card name may be included in the house deck. As your starting point, each house has a 5 Solaris bonus in addition to their starting 20. These may be kept or spent to buy programs, and or produce extra starting favor or spice. Favor costs 2 Solaris per point, and spice costs the game's starting current rate of exchange plus 1 each. When counting this bonus, spice is not taken from the guild hoard. Programs cost 1 Solari each, and are placed face down beneath the homeworld. These programs are not considered subdued, nor are they a part of the Imperial deck in any way. As Imperial cards, programs are unique, and only one given program card may be purchased. All of these starting point bonuses are decided and set before the start of any game, during house profile creation. You should now have enough information to play a game of the Dune CCG. Linked in the description are additional resources that should answer any further questions that you may have, and card images to get started playing. Thanks for watching.